Oh, actually, I forgot to ask. Tom, do you mind if I record this? <laughs> um, sure, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let's see. Why am I? It's not allowing me to go full screen mode here. That's weird. Maybe close the comment. Is that possible? Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, of course, this does this. Um, Oh, there it is. Okay, it just decides wants to if randomly you're work. Sharing the one app, you might disable that. Okay. Um, bring your share wins. Can everyone see my screen? Is it full screen now? It says multi phase model system in action. So it could be you're sharing the wrong screen. Try the. Uh, okay. Try again. Let's try. That's it. That's perfect. Okay. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties there. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, so uh, today we'll be talking about um, Beyond Yuri Miller, Pathways to Life in Prebiotically Relevant Environments Using Plasmas. And really, um, I'm particularly excited to talk about this, um, this origin of life problem because I think it's really an interesting intersection between uh, chemistry, biology, and and really when I say chemistry, it's very broad, it includes geochemistry, organic chemistry. And as I'll talk about today, um, even branches of physics, which is um, more conventional for non-equilibrium synthetic pathways. And what makes it so interesting is, can be broadly summarized by the following puzzles. Well, we know molecules aren't alive, chemical reactions aren't alive, and yet we have cells that are assembling um, components of reacting molecules, and we define those as being alive. And so there's a tremendous number of questions that you can ask from this simple puzzle, including things like, um, what is life? Do we define life as a, simply a combination of chemical reactions and reaction pathways? Um, do we define it as something that's self-replicating? Do we define it as um, something that is stochastic or random? Um, and more so, do we allow uh, life to only occur through one reaction pathway? In other words, is there only one form or can there be multiple pathways to life? And so there's all kinds of very, very broad questions that you can have right at the intersection of chemistry and, and biology. And, and you can view life as more of a, a definition according to uh, chemistries and reaction pathways, or you can think about it in, in more complicated ways. And, and there's obviously a, a number of philosophical debates you can have over it as well. Um, but um, interestingly enough, we know that what we consider to be life and the path of the uh, job responsibility of a cell can be described as replicating and regulating and producing the components necessary for replication. And so when you look at the complexity of life, it's incredible. And so we, we think of uh, the cellular metabolic pathways we show here includes tremendous complexity. And so if you think back to a prebiotic environment with very, very simple molecules, um, how in the world could we get to this level of complexity? And more so, was that process chaotic? Was that process random? Did that process um, produce a single answer? So was there a single pathway to this or, or could there have been multiple? And so um, th there's a variety of different uh, ways to visualize this process. And there's been a tremendous amount of, of work about it. And one, one um, work that I particularly like is by um, John Sutherland, who describes the approach to life through this degree of aliveness parameter. And, and so th the way they think about it is that if you start from prebiotic chemistry, which are very simple molecules, think nitrogen, um, uh, carbon dioxide, water, um, and somehow we form at the end these self-replicating systems that have memory um, and can form what we consider to be defined as life, whatever we want to call that, right? And so um, they, they hypothesize this, this would occur through multiple uh, individual steps and optimization. And so when you think about chemical optimization, um, the requirement really is that we need some level of energy dissipation to explore all of these different pathways where you take very, very simple molecules and you start building up more and more complicated molecules 
in order for them to be eventually self-replicating and approaching um, DNA, RNA, and so forth. And so actually how um, these molecules would have explored this vast space is a really, really interesting one. And more so, is there a bottleneck in this process? In other words, is there a certain optimization where um, all of the, the eventual life would have, would have actually occurred through, um, through that intermediate state or through that individual confirmation? And so one way to think about this is, is to uh, think about it either from uh, starting from the simple molecules, um, things like, as we talked about, CO2 or nitrogen, and moving forward or starting with very complicated molecules that we associate with life that have these components that are able to replicate that we see today like DNA and RNA and working our way backwards. And there's been a tremendous amount of work on both ends of the spectrum, but what makes this original life problem so interesting is that really to connect it, you have to connect it across scales and understand how you can start from simple things, how those simple things combine into more complicated molecules, how those co more complicated molecules eventually start um, uh, forming into molecules that eventually have memory and can regulate and self-replicate and, and approach things like RNA and DNA. So that pathway is very interesting and how it explores that pathway is, is, is an even more interesting question. Um, and in today's talk, what we're primarily gonna focus on is um, this transition from simple molecules, so simple chemicals, um, to what we consider to be RNA precursors. So, uh, more complicated molecules that can then um, be synthesized or go through some reaction pathway to form something like RNA or DNA. And um, there's been a tremendous amount of beautiful experiments in laboratory um, where um, experiments have shown or organic chemists have been able to, um, to take RNA precursors or select environmental conditions. And so that you can form um, things like um, uh, amino acids or RNA uh, or in fact, there's one beautiful experiment that I'll talk about in a second where they synthesized vitamin B12 from um, hydrogen cyanide basically and, and other in prebiotically relevant conditions. But the question is, um, is that when we transition from these simple prebiotic precursors from say at a known atmosphere and a known ocean composition, how is the pathway simple or is there many, many pathways upon which we can move from what we consider to be simple, unreactive molecules in order to move toward these, these precursor um, uh, components or molecules. So before we get into that, a little bit about what the environment that we're gonna be working with. And so um, there's still some, um, if you look in the literature, there's still some um, disagreement about some of these conditions, but we'll, we'll move forward assuming these are true. So some features about that was, first of all, how much land was there? So the exact ocean uh, area coverage is, is a bit debatable. Um, certainly some things that are constrained, we know that the, the sun in that environment was UV rich and that the uh, atmospheric composition in prebiotic times was primarily CO2, nitrogen, and water vapor, and that the ocean was acidic with a, a large amount of iron oxide or iron two plus, I should say. Um, and in this environment, in order to move from prebiotic conditions to um, these, uh, what we consider to be the pathway to life, the question is, how did we take different sets of molecules and reactions and form this living system in this environment? So going back to um, a lot of the current work, um, there's been a tremendous number of beautiful uh, organic synthesis um, papers where they start from some um, precursor molecule, something like that's reactive like hydrogen cyanide or hydrogen sulfide, um, and are able to synthesize very, very um, complicated molecules um, in prebiotically relevant conditions. And so this is an example here. And for those who are organic chemists, they can make more sense of this, but the bottom line is you can form very, very complicated um, molecules. The issue with this though, is that first of all, there's a prescribed availability of a certain molecule, in this case, hydrogen cyanide, but more importantly, these synthetic pathways are taking place in very, very precise step-by-step -step conditions in the laboratory. And it's debatable whether or not in a prebiotically reactive environment, um, whether or not you know, these level of control is gonna be possible. So would the synthesis pathways 
take place in such a controlled environment or would it go through a much more chaotic and, and dissipative reaction pathway? Um, and so um, one of the important molecules that's referenced a lot is this idea of hydrogen cyanide. And so with hydrogen cyanide, you can synthesize a variety of prebiotic organic compounds. Um, and so where would the hydrogen cyanide come from? And so right now it goes back to this, one thought is that it occurs through um, uh, me meteoric carbon going through a hypersonic reentry phase into the earth and having carbon react with, with uh, either water vapor or some source of hydrogen and the nitrogen in the atmosphere um, to form some HCN that can then embed itself um, and go through some geochemical uh, pathways. And hydrogen cyanide is obviously a very, very important uh, molecule for some of these um, reaction pathways. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about primarily today was this notion that if we start with a prebiotic environment, primarily of inert atmosphere, say CO2, nitrogen, and hydrogen, and the goal is to explain how we can get to complicated molecules like RNA, is there only one prebiotic precursor like hydrogen cyanide or hydrogen sulfide that's required, or are there many, many different pathways that can move from one to the other? And if there are, how could that actually occur? So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today is trying to look at starting from a prebiotic environment and seeing different ways that we can actually create more complicated molecules by leveraging some of the interesting chemical environments that might've occurred in prebiotic times. Okay. So um, with that, I'll jump into the, the Miller-Urey experiment and I'll give a brief summary of what it is and then explain a little bit how we build upon it. So the, the Miller-Urey experiment, for those who aren't familiar, is a historically significant experiment in the origin of life. It really um, was the genesis for the field in many ways. And um, the experiment um, tried to explore the role of a unique type of non-equilibrium environment during prebiotic times, which is um, electrical discharges, specifically lightning. And what they wanted to take was a, at the time, a proposed prebiotic atmosphere composition. At the time, it was a reducing atmosphere, which has since been considered to be controversial, but including methane and ammonia and hydrogen, um, and see what would actually be synthesized afterwards. And uh, they created a, uh, an, a reactor in this case, and their reactor had um, this prebiotic um, atmosphere in it, and uh, they ran through a plasma arc discharge, which is a form of non-equilibrium um, a discharge that I'll talk a little bit more about what it actually does to the gaseous atmosphere later. Um, but they ran this for a really long time. It was actually for about a week and had it naturally circulating through a collection flask. And so what happened was, is as these molecules moved through the, the arc, um, the, the chemical bonds were excited and eventually broken and more and more complicated uh, molecules were thus synthesized. And these molecules were transported around through the natural circulation and were collected in this flask at the bottom. And uh, what was noted, if you read the original um, science paper, and it's got some interesting history, um, for those of you interested, um, some uh, that's summarized, I guess, in the um, 50 year anniversary of it. Um, but uh, after about a week, they noticed, the graduate student at the time noticed that the collection flask liquid had turned um, a, a reddish or a yellowish brown color, implying that some organic compound had been uh, formed inside of the solution. And uh, at the time, um, the uh, level of analytical chemistry was significantly lower than it is today. So, um, but they were still able to, to prove that um, amino acids had been formed using uh, paper chromatography. And um, not only had they be formed, but they had been formed in significant quantities. Um, so over the years, these results have been improved upon as um, mass spectrometry and other uh, analytical techniques have kind of come online um, to really understand the the uh, product distribution um, in, in these environments. So going back to this question of um, how can we actually explore how we can go from prebiotic conditions to um, the pathways to life and are there multiple pathways um, to actually achieve that? What we wanted to do was look at the leverage this non-equilibrium um, electrical discharge, this lightning as a way to uh, break apart and excite these um, prebiotic atmospheres and see um, by tracking the reaction mechanism, 
and the um, reaction pathway more specifically, see how uh, more complex organic species um, can be synthesized both in the gas and the liquid. So what we did is we took a, um, a, a lightning system, a model prebiotic system, and we were interested specifically in looking at how these lightning strikes actually interact across phases. And we think that this is actually really important. I'll explain why in a second. But the idea here was when you have a, an electrical non-equilibrium discharge that propagates to a liquid, then the liquid can be used to stabilize some of these very, very reactive intermediate species. And these stabilized species in the liquid can then further propagate um, more and more complicated reaction pathways to synthesize larger and larger molecules. Without this, the, um, as in the Uri Miller experiment, um, then the, uh, the, uh, the number of different pathways toward synthesizing complex organic species is, is dramatically reduced because as you get larger molecules, they get successively broken down in the gas phase. Um, and so here we can actually stabilize them across interfaces. Um, the other thing we can do is we'll show is you can actually start adding in um, catalysts and solid particulates um, that might have occurred in prebiotic times from volcanoes or other uh, media and look at the interaction of how these intermediate um, radicals in the gas phase can actually couple onto catalytic materials and be stabilized there. And there's a tremendous number of pathways that can occur because the core idea of what's happening here is that we have an electrode at the top that's applied to very, very high voltage trying to simulate a, a lightning strike in the laboratory. And, um, and what happens is we, we accelerate um, electrons um, that can then bounce into other molecules and excite different bonds. And, uh, and these allow through either vibrational, rotational, um, or electronic um, excitations, these allow these bonds to be selectively broken and form radical species um, very, very efficiently in the laboratory. And we can do this at atmospheric pressure um, and, um, and outside of these lightning strikes without having a uh, near room temperature. So there's not a, a requirement to have very, very um, demanding uh, environmental conditions here. Um, and um, unlike the Yuri Miller experiment, we wanted to start with an atmospheric composition um, of nitrogen and CO2 only and not leverage the reducing atmosphere. So remove the methane and, um, and other types of, uh, of, of reducing molecules and, and the ammonia that was used previously. And, and we'll show that uh, while this does reduce the, the, the increase the amount of time it takes, it still doesn't remove the ability to synthesize these, these complex organic species. Um, and the second thing, and I think this is essential, is really trying to track the mechanism that's formed. Because it's one thing to understand that we can synthesize these molecules, but if we want to understand um, how we actually go about generating um, life, understanding the reaction pathways going from simple molecules to uh, larger and larger molecules is really, really important because there could be a bottleneck, there could be some uh, energy minimization, there could be some, some way in which these reaction pathways collapse upon themselves and, and one predominant pathway actually occurs. It's very, very complicated though. Um, so as I talked about the importance of these, um, these different phases and non-equilibriums can be explored um, and explained by looking at uh, differences in time scale. So within a, a, a lightning strike, for example, um, the whole idea is that it's in a state of both kinetic and thermal non-equilibrium. And what that means is that the there, it, the system cannot be characterized with a single temperature. So uh, there's a characteristic temperature of electrons, the free electrons that are bouncing and exciting these molecules. There's a characteristic vibrational temperature of the, of the uh, gas, rotational temperature, and then it, also a gas temperature. And each of these distinct modes has a certain relaxation time. Um, that means that um, depending on what species this lightning strike forms, what radical species um, that if you can actually add in a separate phase, for instance, a catalyst or a liquid that can stabilize some of these radicals, then the number of different reaction pathways that you can um, explore with this model system dramatically increases compared to having, for instance, two electrodes in a gas where um, eventually the system will relax or, um, or the radical species will be broken down um, subsequently by the next lightning strike. And so the ability to have um, interfacial timescales, adsorption reactions, and uh, interaction with liquids is uh, really, really um, important. And, and an interesting um, uh, exploration of reaction pathways in prebiotic conditions.
Um, so to give you an idea of what the model system looks like in action, so here's an example of a, um, a uh, plasma discharge that's taken um, the top electrode, um, in this case is our cathode, so that we have electrons that are directed downward toward the interface. And this is to um, represent um, lightning discharges. And um, in this case, what actually we're visualizing here is we have a, uh, an N2 CO2 atmosphere that we purge through. And, uh, and then at the bottom, we actually have, in this case, it's ice that um, the lightning is propagating on. And what you see is the color change there is actually um, illustrating a pH gradient that's forming. And um, so what actually happened is a universal indicator was actually frozen inside of the ice. And so you can see that there is um, uh, interaction and changes to the interfacial chemistry that's happening because of these electrons that are directed at the interface. And, and as we move into um, exploring the pathways of the reaction, reactive chemistry that's happening, we'll show how these, these um, interfacial electrons, especially in the liquid phase, uh, called solvated electrons can really, really drive interesting uh, reaction pathways, um, all from these non-equilibrium plasmas. Okay, so a little bit about, um, so let's start. Um, so as I talked about earlier, one of the really important things that we wanted to focus on was exploring the reaction mechanism in these environments. And that can be broken down across phases. Um, and so the first is, is uh, the gas phase. And the gas phase is where the plasma actually starts um, and uh, starting at the cathode tip and propagating down to our prebiotic ocean environment. Um, and what makes these, these gas phase plasmas um, so interesting, as I said before, is that they can really, um, they generate free electrons. And these free electrons um, in many ways act like little billiard balls and knock into uh, stable uh, um, mole molecules like CO2 and nitrogen and excite them to allow more complicated intermediate species to be synthesized. And so here's an example on the left of um, electron energy loss fraction. So it's, it's an idea for a particular um, reduced electric field and mean electron energy, how the electron energy is being partitioned between these molecules. And you can see that um, depending on exactly the, the electric field, um, so, so the spark conditions are highlighted, which is relevant to our experiment. Um, how the electron energy is distributed. And so it's distributed between combination of uh, nitrogen excitations and CO2 excitations, both vibrational excitations um, and also direct association reactions. And so um, what this means is that these, these free electrons can, can both excite these molecules, but also drive them to form uh, more complicated intermediates um, all at near room temperature um, because it's in a state of non-equilibrium. And that ability to um, excite a very, very stable bond like N triple bond N um, really allows um, us to take a prebiotically inert atmosphere and move towards synthesizing more and more reactive species. So exploring actually how this process works is what we really wanted to look at in this work. Um, and so the first thing we did was um, we wanted to look, as I said, on the, at the gas phase and at the chemistry that's happening um, at the interface of the electrode. And so um, what we did was we took a uh, UV vis spectrometer. Um, and for those of you who primarily look at uh, gas phase chemistry, one of the nice things about when you look in um, at plasmas in the gas phase is that they have, um, they emit strongly. Um, and uh, this emission is kind of a fingerprint that you can use to infer um, some of the molecules. And so this, this relative intensity we looked at for different atmospheric compositions. The top is a CO2 atmosphere. Um, the middle is a nitrogen CO2 atmosphere. And then the bottom is just a nitrogen atmosphere. And we see a few um, key features. The first is that these free electrons do um, form atomic fragments. So for instance, we form oxygen and carbon radicals in the, in the CO atmosphere. Um, and uh, we form uh, nitrogen and oxygen from the um, water um, into, into atmosphere. Um, but in the mixture, um, we start forming um, uh, intermediates like CN and CH, um, which um, if uh, HCN is an important um, intermediary, um, could actually be contributing um, toward um, lo longer and longer um, uh, reaction pathways. So how does this actually happen? Well, as I mentioned, these stable molecules like hydrogen, nitrogen, and CO2 are impacted with these excited electrons. 
and they form these radical species that have very short lifetimes. So these radical species can either interact with one another. For instance, you can have a nitrogen radical interact with a, a oxygen radical and form NO, um, or you can have them uh, recombine to form N2, or interestingly enough, as we'll show momentarily, you can have them interact with different phases, either catalysts or uh, liquid layers and start forming um, uh, more complicated for if it's carbon relevant organic species. So for the liquid phase, it gets quite interesting. So the idea here is now um, we form these in reactive intermediates in the gas phase in the middle of these lightning discharges. And somehow um, these reactive intermediates are interacting with the surface um, to form um, stable aqueous compounds that we, we can then um, track in time. And, and the great thing about this is that while the um, intermediates in the gas phase are very, very short lived, typically, for some of the radical species, um, and certainly ionic species, it's going to be less than a microsecond. Um, the aqueous uh, species um, are stable, and so we can use a variety of additional analytical techniques instead of just gaseous spectroscopy um, to really infer production rates um, and uh, and track these mechanisms. And so, one of the first things that we did was um, looked at. Uh, changes in, in uh, H plus concentration, pH over time. And, and first of all, we noticed that um, for successive um, exposures to these plasma environments, um, that the, the pH is changing. And so actually tracking what's happening there was a, was a goal that we had. And we wanted to track it both from the gas phase and the liquid phase environment. And it's actually very complicated because what's actually happening at the interface is these, these individual lightning strikes that are coming down that each carry about, um, have peak currents of about 10 amps, um, carry these solvated electrons. And so what actually happens is that the, the interface becomes a virtual cathode and you can drive electrochemical reactions in the liquid solution um, with these excited electrons. Um, and uh, it makes the number of reaction pathways um, uh, significantly increase. Um, so what, what do we actually measure? So in the gas phase, depending on the amount of, of water um, that was used, we formed a significant amount of NO and NO2. And so that can be explained by us breaking apart these nitrogen and uh, water vapor uh, molecules and forming NO and NO2. Or if there's CO2, if it's 95.5, then you can, you can form CO and O, and then the nitrogen radical can, can interact with the oxygen radical form NO and NO2. In the, um, if we look at the products in the solution, um, we found that a combination of nitrite, nitrate, and H plus were formed. Um, and then on a lower amount, we also uh, measured production of ammonium and formic acid. Um, and the way we actually quantified this was we looked at, we borrowed um, a, um, a description of this process using uh, electrochemistry and tried to quantify how much charge is actually transmitted. So what the am amount of actual electric charge is transmitted through the electrodes and then quantified the production of these in terms of the number of products formed per electrons transmitted. And we see a remarkable efficiency here. So for instance, there's many, many NO molecules that are synthesized per electron and, um, and many, many, for instance, CO molecules in the gas phase produced per electron. Um, in the uh, and that also occurs in the liquid phase where we formed a large amount of nitrate, nitrite, and ammonium, much greater than one per electron in the liquid phase. So what we wanted to do was prove how these mechanisms couple across the phases. So we had some hypotheses that, for instance, if you have we form stable NO and NO2 in the gas phase, so could that be actually coupling into the into the solution phase? Um, and interacting there. And, and one of the ways I'll show in a second that we looked at this was our original hypothesis was that the NO was actually being partitioned into the aqueous environment, to the, the water, the prebiotic relevant ocean, um, by um, interacting with an OH radical at the interface. Um, and these OH radicals are being produced by solvated electrons breaking apart the water molecule to form OH and H radicals. And um, what our objective was to really infer the, those reaction pathways. Um, so one of the things we looked at doing was to take our, um, our atmosphere 
into and CO2 with water and look at doing isotopic substitution to infer some reaction mechanisms. And so um, what we found was that um, nitrate, this NO3, if we track the, part, the oxygen speciation on that, that we were actually um, generating um, some of the nitrate from oxygen on both the hydro, uh, on both the water molecule and on the CO2. And so what that's telling us is that um, if we start with um, our, our plasma in the gas phase, that the gas and liquid uh, reaction mechanisms are being coupled. And as we thought that the um, liquid is helping to stabilize some of these intermediate radical species and really increasing the um, production efficiency um, of these um, intermediate complexity molecules. And so for nitrate, as an example, um, this illustrates how we can take a non-equilibrium environment in the gas phase and stabilize it um, in a uh, ocean environment. For carbon fixation, it got actually very complicated. Um, so we're looking at, for instance, proton and MR with an N2CO2 environment. The number of molecules that we actually synthesize is very, very large. Um, and uh, it, it gets, and they have differing amounts of production and different efficiencies. The major product was uh, ammonium, um, but we also formed things like um, uh, methanol, acetic acid, uh, formic acid, and, and these were all at relatively um, appreciable yields. And so um, needless to say, the ability to excite these, um, these inert molecules and, and uh, stabilize them in the aqueous environment really, really opens up a huge number of reaction pathways. And this, this is part of the original um, hypothesis was that really, you know, if you look at uh, life, um, you know, did it occur through a single pathway um, or, or, you know, did it occur in, in these types of non-equilibrium environments where you can synthesize huge numbers of different um, molecular intermediates um, at reasonable concentrations and then um, proceed through that in some um, pathway toward uh, self-assembly and, and energy minimization. In terms of formic acid, um, we also looked at how that was forming um, and um, carbon-13 in MR really helped us here. Um, the hypothesis we had here was, first of all, the formic acid formation efficiency was quite high. And um, our hypothesis was that the CO2 um, <clears throat> was actually, the, uh, the, the dissolved CO2 was actually um, interacting with solvated electrons at the interface to form CO2 minus, um, which then interacts with um, protons to form formic acid. And um, when we did um, carbon-13 MR, it showed significant amount of, of dis CO dissolved CO2 and also um, this uh, synthetic pathway of formic acid. And we think this is significant and, and quite efficient. Um, and yet another way that um, non-equilibrium environments in the gas phase um, can couple to these ocean relevant conditions. Um, so the next thing we looked at was environmental impact. And this is when it got quite interesting. Um, so the goal was to try to um, explore different uh, relevant conditions in prebiotic times and how those influence not only the yield, but also uh, the speciation and how the, the yield changes. Um, and so the, the first um, exploration was looking at um, as we talked about the uh, kind of a snowball earth scenario where we have ice formation. And so what this does is it changes the kinetics and the charge transfer at the interface. Um, over time, the lightning will melt the ice and, uh, and then these, um, there's a slow kinetic transfer of, of um, protons as these solvated electrons penetrate farther and farther in and um, these reactive intermediates penetrate um, farther into the, uh, into the ice, which is really, really interesting. Um, and uh, what we looked at next was the changes in conversion efficiency as a function of different environments. So um, the first one was looking at the influence of, of iron two plus in the, um, in the ocean. And so for low iron, for instance, less than 0.5 millimolar, um, we saw a distribution of, um, of nitrate, nitrite, and ammonium at differing levels um, as when we added more and more iron two plus. And what we speculate is happening here is a third phase is contributing where um, the iron two plus either is acting catalytically or it's acting electrolytically 
to consume some of these solvated electrons that are driving some of the reaction pathways to form um, some of these important intermediate species. Um, we also looked at adding in relevant um, minerals, sedimentary minerals, including things like uh, phosphoride, pyrite, um, relevant to um, volcanoes, and see how they change the speciation and couple to these non-equilibrium um, lightning discharges. And so um, one significant one, first of all, there was a difference, in, uh, statistically significant difference across these, um, but really importantly uh, was a change in the uh, production efficiency of ammonium, NH4+, which has a different reaction pathway than, than NO3 and NO2-. minus. Um, so that was really interesting and illustrates that, in fact, these um, interfacial catalysts do um, also change um, the, the uh, reaction pathway of these intermediates and help to stabilize them in different ways. Um, we also looked at changes in, in temperature um, to really look at some of the kinetics uh, in the transfer. And then finally, we looked at changes in, in atmospheric composition um, on, on the conversion efficiency, including um, both um, dry and, and what we consider to be wet with different relative humidities. Um, and the goal with this was to do a level of product extrapolation um, to try and figure out we have a prebiotically relevant um, environment that we can create in the laboratory. And if we upscale that to um, lightning conditions, and uh, anytime you start doing an upscaling like this, you start running into potential criticisms. But um, depending on, and it, there's a wide variety of sources on this, but depending on um, the frequency that you can um, assume, um, then you can scale these um, small scale laboratory discharges to approximate how much of these critical fixation products, both carbon and nitrogen fixation products, you can synthesize annually in one of these prebiotic environments. And so the laboratory discharges that we form, um, as, as we talked about earlier, are in the order of about 10 amp peak currents. Um, we're applying about 20 kilovolts of peak voltage. Um, and so that means that if you compare that to a common lightning strike, um, lightning strikes are typically on the order of kiloamps of current. Um, uh, our discharges are about 100 nanoseconds in duration. So they're spark discharges, not arcs. Um, the uh, lightning discharge is typically about six orders of magnitude longer in time. Um, and, um, but interestingly enough, um, the, uh, if you normalize that with the cross-sectional area, we actually can generate the thermodynamic environments of these lightning strikes in the laboratory with reasonable consistency. So if we calculate it as we did earlier, where we get a conversion efficiency per electron, we can then upscale that to, um, to the number of electrons estimated per lightning strike um, in a, uh, a lightning strike on earth or some prebiotic environment and, and calculate annual production. And so what we found is on a per electron basis, if you upscale it like that, then we're able to synthesize tons of nitrate, nitrite, ammonium, um, hydroxide and, and formic acid um, in a prebiotic environment. And, um, and also if you extrapolate it on an energy basis, you're a few orders of magnitude higher production um, from there. And so, you know, and this strongly depends also on the frequency of the lightning strike. So for instance, if you're above a, a active volcano site, then um, the lightning strike density would sig be significantly higher potentially. Um, but one thing to, that's important to consider here is that we've just picked out four major fixation products and that as we showed with some of the NMR results, the number of intermediates that are stabilized in the liquid is significantly more. And so this just illustrates that even if geochemistry is, is important in terms of bringing um, some of these um, species like HCN to the earth, um, that um, there's non-equilibrium environments in a prebiotic planetary environment that can also produce some of these um, fixation products in situ and perhaps could have driven um, reaction pathways toward life um, and, and could have been an essential part to that. And so um, that's my talk for today. Um, I think I'm about one minute early here, but um, I'd like to acknowledge um, George Whitesides um, and uh, uh, Joy, Jeffrey, Muhammad, and Dimitar. Um, these results were um, collaborative in that sense. And, and uh, with that, I will um, take any questions. Excellent. Great talk. Uh, any questions? I'll raise one. Uh, this is David, who's 
finally made it back from my other meeting I, and would like to thank Sean for hosting. Um, uh, does, does it matter what kind of electrodes you use? That is, do you get metal coming off of those electrodes? Oh, that's, that's an absolutely, that's an excellent question. Um, and um, we actually found that it actually dramatically does matter. Um, and, but it's actually the most significant um, electrode is actually the electrode in the aqueous environment. Um, and the reason why is, for instance, a lot of what we uh, formed initially, we had a platinum anode. And what was actually happening is we were driving significant um, catalytic electrochemical reactions yeah. there. Um, but the point you bring up about the gas phase, um, so we actually transitioned to a tungsten electrode in the gas phase to try and limit catalytic activity. Um, but it is a source of uncertainty. And, and we did change, um, uh, we, we swapped around to tungsten and it seemed to, um, to, to change the reaction pathway, but we have chain, um, explored that effect. And certainly catalytic effects, both in the gas phase and the solution do matter. Great. Yeah, go ahead, Craig. All right, yeah, I'm on my phone, so I don't know whether this, uh, can you hear me? I yes. can. Yeah, okay, great. I, so clearly you're focusing on lightning in this interface is really fascinating. Uh, did, but did you gain any new insight into black smokers in the process or contemplated yourself as to what you've learned and whether that might pertain to a black smoker, which presumably doesn't have a lot of lightning around it? That's, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I guess this is a broader opportunity to, uh, to talk about, you know, some, some uh, opportunities for collaborations. Uh, the, the focus that, that I've had on this particular project is really to, to explore the way that these non-equilibrium mechanisms couple across phases. And so, um, you know, applying some of these results to, um, to other um, environments, I haven't really gotten that far yet, but certainly that's of interest. Um, and I'd certainly be interested in talking to you more about that and seeing how we Great. can maybe frame that. Yeah, fascinating talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess mine was actually similar to Craig's, <laughs> but but in a different direction. I mean, there seems to be this argument about the wet dry being required, and this these are clearly designed as a as a wet environment test. And I guess, you know, did, is that is that where your thoughts are as the most likelihood direction to be investigating in terms of the transition out of the prebiotic, is in an uh, ocean type uh, environment? I, I think so. I mean. Um... I think that, um, you know, especially, and this is one example of a reaction pathway, right? But I certainly think when you have these, I mean, the requirement is to, you know, have some, in order to move out of prebiotic conditions, you have to be out of equilibrium, right? I mean, bio, biology requires out of equilibrium conditions. And so um, what, in this case, what the, the aqueous phase does is it, it stabilizes um, these, um, these out of equilibrium conditions and allows them to exist much longer. And, and what we've explored here is that how you can have very, very short lived intermediates in the gas phase be stabilized um, across phases very efficiently. And I, and I think that there is, there's a lot to explore there mechanistically and we've tried to explore that, but this is really just the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, because um, you know, as we, as you dig deeper into some of these um, some of these analytical measurements of what's happening at the interface, the, just the number of species that you can form is just astounding. I mean, it, it, there's a huge, huge number. I mean, you, these non-equilibrium environments in these, energe these um, energetic plasmas can break virtually any bond. And so the question becomes is, okay, so you form this soup of species and now how, how do they actually start um, self, you know, how do you form something that approaches toward um, you know, life. And so it, it's just incredibly interesting. Uh, but I do believe that the, uh, in this case, the interfacial chemistry is, is absolutely uh, essential. And I think it, it's an important component. Great. Thanks. All right. Any other questions from the group? I have a question. Go ahead. Please. Um, I'm a pathologist and geochemist. When I saw your experiment, I think this is very interesting. So 
in terms of the wet and dry condition, I wonder, um, do you have to have liquid water or vapor help as well? That's a that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I think vapor uh, vapor does change the atmospheric composition. Um, I think that um, uh, certainly. Uh, I mean, we, we've done some experiments. Where we've tried to um, have um, some type of um, droplet formation, so it doesn't have to be a stable body. For instance, I mean, if you had a, I think you just need some type of interface, right? So, for instance. Um, if you had a catalytic material, um, uh, you know, a, a geologically reactive species, and we chose a few like pyrite and a few others, um, but those can, those can, that's also an interfacial um, species. And so those can stabilize and change the pathways as well, where you have these radicals that can then go and absorb onto some of these species um, and then follow more conventional reaction pathways. Um, so I, I think that uh, it doesn't require a large stable um, ocean body, um, but that is one one pathway. I think it just needs something where you can take these these very very short lived um, intermediates in the gas phase and somehow stabilize them. I see. So you mentioned the interface would a um, like you mentioned pyrite would the other type of a uh, you know rocky material would help to create. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that's one example that we pulled out. But certainly, really any type of catalytic material. Um, can interact because I mean, for for example, I mean, if you if you start forming um, activated CO or you form uh, uh, nitrogen radicals or you know a variety of, um, of catalysts um, can stabilize those. So um, these are just a small subset, but um, that's certainly a really really interesting direction um, that, that we're interested in exploring too. So and um, we're always looking to for collaborators on that. Yeah. Pretty cool. Thank you. Thanks. What about temperature ranges? Was that played with at all? Uh, we did try it down uh, here. Um, let's see. So we looked at um, 80C, oh, 25C, yeah. okay. and zero. Um, so the it, it wasn't, we really can't infer too much from it. Um, so, but uh, we, we did see, for instance, in the ice that the interfacial uh, kinetic uh, Time scales were very, very different because of these solvation effects. And so we, we did, and you can see that we, we took videos of that and you could see that. So, so there was a there was a change there in, in some of the um, solution chemistry. So the the chemistry as these electrons are flowing inside the solution, those also changed. Um, but in terms of the speciation between um, nitrite, nitrate, and ammonium, we, we didn't really see anything significant. All right, thanks. Yep. All right, any last minute questions? Okay, let's thank Tom uh, one more time. That was really great. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And uh, for those who are interested, we are staying on this um, Zoom channel, so to speak, uh, for an NSF uh, uh, conversation about breaking into some project teams for those who are interested in the, in the GLOW opportunity, the, the geoscience learning from other worlds opportunity. Um, and uh, so just we'll be starting here in about seven minutes on the same, the same Zoom channel. All right. Thanks very much, Tom. That was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you.